Coming up on Tech News Today, Google says, want to buy a watch or a game console or remodeled Nexus Q? That's the rumor anyway. Also, Time Warner Cable coming to Xbox. No rumor there. And Facebook, back to rumor, may get a chat room. All that and more coming up. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Friday, June 28th, 2013. Tech News Today is brought to you by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform that makes it fast and easy to create a professional website, blog, portfolio, or online store. For a free trial and 10% off on your first purchase on new accounts, go to squarespace.com and use offer code TNT6. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Aya Zach. And I'm Jason Howell. And this is the show where we try to keep you up to date on the most important stories in the tech world, starting each time with the top 10 stories of the day in the Fused News. I speak French. BlackBerry reported a loss of 13 cents a share last quarter on sales of $3.07 billion. Analysts expected a profit of 8 cents a share on sales of $3.37 billion. The company shipped 6.8 million smartphones, short of the expected 7.5 million smartphones. A portion of the loss was attributed to Venezuelan currency controls, but not all of it. CEO Thorsten Hines confirmed that the company has canceled plans to bring the BlackBerry 10 operator system to the BlackBerry Playbook tablet. The Wall Street Journal is reporting that Google is working on a video game console and a smartwatch, both powered by Android. The journal also says Google is going to refresh the Nexus Q, and if this is all accurate, we'll see at least one of these products by the fall. Microsoft announced that the Xbox 360 will get a Time Warner Cable app that will give Time Warner Cable subscribers up to 300 live television channels. You'll have to be an Xbox Live Gold member to take advantage of the service, and the app will launch later this summer. BlueStacks today announced a second game console, the GamePop Mini. The Mini runs Android Jelly Bean, connects with an included HDMI cable, and will be free. Yep, you just pay $6.99 a month for access to all the games, but you get access to all their games. Obviously, the Mini has also got a different chipset, so it's probably going to run slower. But BlueStacks said it will support most games. They will be available for pre-order July 1st and ship later on this year, probably in the winter. Okay, so officially everyone in the world is making a watch, or at least Foxconn, Han Hai, showed off a smartwatch that can wire wirelessly connect to an iPhone. It can display incoming phone calls, Facebook posts. This is all being reported by Want China Times. The watch can check your heartbeat, your respiration, other vital signs, and if your vital signs are weak, supposedly the watch will suggest how you might get healthier. The company's wireless and medical research divisions also say they'll add fingerprint recognition in order to monitor your personal health. Are you in the market for some spectrum? Well, the FCC might have something for you. According to Fierce Wireless, the FCC has approved draft rules for the auction of the 1900 megahertz PCSH block, which could have implications for both DISH and Sprint. The auction would occur either late this year or early 2014. Whenever I go to the beach, I always use PCSH Block, just to be safe. Oh. Sam Mobile reports Android 4.3, the as-yet-unannounced Android update, has been seen on the Google Play edition of the Samsung Galaxy S4 and the Snapdragon-powered S4. Users of those models who don't mind flashing ROMs, which can be dangerous, can get instructions on how to try 4.3 at sammobile.com. We'll have the link in our show notes, too. Clickable hashtags are coming to Facebook's mobile website, and though not to its iOS and Android apps, searching for a particular hashtag will bring up similar ones. Facebook analyzes which terms are posted together. So looking for, for example, hashtag Sarah Lane rocks will also bring up posts tagged with chocolate or cats. Probably. That, that, that's a good Well, guess. they're similar, so it would yeah, just... Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. T-Mobile USA has agreed to buy wireless spectrum from U.S. Cellular in the Mississippi Valley region for $308 million. T-Mobile said the new spectrum will help the company expand its LTE network across 29 new markets. T-Mobile also announced an event July 10th at 2.30 p.m. in New York City, teasing it as our boldest move yet. The Guardian published a top-secret document that talks about the National Security Agency's productive partnership with a couple of telecoms that dates back shortly after September 11th. 
The telecoms allowed September 11, 20, 2001, excuse me. The telecoms allowed their fiber links to be tapped for surveillance. The document doesn't name the companies, but Declan McCullough over at CNET says the information points to AT&T and Verizon. This episode of Tech News Today brought to you by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform that makes it fast and easy to create a professional website, blog, portfolio, or online store with their e-commerce solution. Actually, this morning, I was so darn busy. Uh, I, I had Darren coming over. I need to get things ready for him. I, I had uh, my, my wife, my nephew were up doing stuff. The dogs were running around. And I'm preparing for the show, and I realize, you know, I'm not going to have a lot of time later today. I wonder if I could get the Sword and Laser Rewind video episode posted quickly. You know what? With Squarespace, I could. I did. It was amazing. I could not have done it if Squarespace did not make things so easy. It was cut and paste, drag and drop. I just put the video in. I said, this is the embed code. And it said, great, we've got a thumbnail for you. It's all done. Couldn't have done it without him. Exceptionally well-designed, easy to use, fast and easy, powerful and flexible e-commerce. And the thing is, what I love is that not only is it easy to post these posts, but when someone goes to the site, if they're on a little tiny four-inch screen, perhaps, on their phone, it looks like normal. It doesn't look like some crippled mobile site. It looks like a, a site that was designed specifically for that screen. But then if they go to the same site on a seven-inch screen or a 12-inch screen or a 26-inch screen, it looks the same. It looks right on all of those screens. It adapts because Squarespace is smart that way. Also, it's reliable. You, you know your, your site is going to get the best care. They have 24-7 customer support. Integrates all your, all your needs into one platform. Domains, design, development, commerce, hosting. Go try it out, though, for free. You don't even have to give them a credit card number. Just sign up for a free account. Start building your website. If you decide to purchase it, use offer code TNT6. It's good for a couple more days. And get 10% off your first purchase on new accounts. That includes monthly and annual plans. And don't forget... Free domain registration for annual plan customer subscriptions. That's squarespace.com. Use that offer code TNT6. Everything you need to create an exceptional website. And we thank Squarespace for their support of Tech News Today. All right. As I mentioned, joining us now uh, from upstairs at my house, Darren Kitchen, uh, in town for Hack Across America. How's it going, Darren? Oh, it's so good to be here. I'm really enjoying the whole L.A. Santa Monica place. So much fun. And, oh, I was going to sing you happy birthday, but I, I don't want to, uh, you know, violate copyright. Ah, uh, that's okay. You, you, there's an alternate lyrics somewhere on the web that I think will allow you. Because the song, it's not the tune, it's only the lyrics. But thank you. That's very nice oh. of you. Hack5.org, H-A-K-5.org. Also joining us, good to have Len Peralta back. We missed you last week, buddy. Hi, how you doing? Uh, I missed you guys too as well. And, you know, just to upstage Darren, I am going to sing you happy birthday. <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding. I'm not going to sing every I have my finger right, on the mute. Take that, <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, Len, if you don't know, if you haven't been watching on Fridays, Len will be illustrating uh, our stories as we go along, and then we'll check it with him at the end of the show to, to see what he has come up with. Uh, and oftentimes he will put his illustrations up for sale uh, if you'd like to have a print of them. So check that out. Let's uh, dig right in with the, those rumors about Google and their avalanche of new products, Ayaz. Yeah, they're, they're rumored anyway. Wall Street Journal reporting Google's building a game console, a wristwatch, both of them running Android. And the <laughs> journal sources are saying that Google's making these devices to, quote, combat similar devices that Apple may release in the future. Because apparently, Google thinks Apple's building a game console in the next Apple TV that's coming out and a watch. Um, the Google Watch, which connects your phone via Bluetooth, the Nexus Q, remember that sphere that nobody really understood? That thing might get a refresh, according to the journal. And at least one of these devices is coming in the fall. And there is also some information in the journal about Android Keyline Pi, the upcoming release of, of Android, how Google's letting manufacturers a lot more freedom to use Android in devices other than phones and tablets. So now we've got potentially a Google console. Uh, they've had a Google Web TV kind of thing, a Google TV situation, a browser, and now a console. Are they turning into Microsoft, Darren? Uh, no, that would be weird. No, uh, they're, um, they're, I have no idea what they're going after right now. Um, but I do love that they are, um, that they're following potential rumors for product decisions and to which I can only say, uh, I hope that they've heard the rumor that Apple's working on a hoverboard. Did you hear that? Google <laughs> hoverboard. I mean, there is Apple a rumor that Apple's working on a game console though. That could be interesting if, if in this market of ooh yeahs and, and game pops and all of these other little Android consoles, we suddenly get an Apple versus Google behemoth battle. 
I think it's interesting that, I mean, the Apple TV is still supposedly in hobby category and the Google TV initiative has had mixed results. And you've got stuff like Ouya that got a lot of response. I mean, people are really excited about it. But then I'm reading somewhat lackluster reviews of, of anybody who's who's been able to take it for a spin um, in the early days. So companies like Apple and Google do have the manpower and the R&D to put something like this that's awesome together. And I have to assume that if Google thinks Apple is working on a games console, it's probably a little bit more than, you know, flimsy rumors that the rest of us are, you know, reading uh, in whispers on Twitter and that sort of thing. It's there's There's probably some truth to it. Yeah, I mean, there's a good chance that Apple TV could be turned into a game console, just opening it up to the, the iOS app store, some kind of uh, additional way to do that. With You can do that with your, uh, I guess you can AirPlay right now to do that. Uh, with Google coming out with their own product, though, that seems intriguing to me because they've partnered up for for their Google TV. They had, The Nexus Q was their, their uh, in-house build, and it didn't work very well. It's just a very strange device. I'm just kind of curious why the Q didn't turn into that game console. But Google spent a lot of time at I.O. talking about all the gaming platforms and the APIs they have for that. The, everything looked like Game Center style things. If they tie that all together and they have a game console, it, it could be something interesting because Android gaming is actually taking off enough that they could sell a $99 Nexus game console and it would be fine. It's almost like I, the reverse of what Microsoft did. You know, Microsoft, if you use the Xbox as an example, mm -hmm. it's like Xbox was a gaming console. But now the Xbox is a media console that does a lot of stuff. Google's sort of like, we've got a TV arm. And people are like, eh. And now it's like, we're TV and gaming, media <laughs> console. So it's it's like to, to, to bring everybody in. I wonder if Google expected the whole Android gaming thing to take off as uh, hardcore as it has and, and for others like Bluestacks to try to kind of pave the way for an Android uh, console. Um, I mean, if you know, it's hard not to be excited about the prospects of Google doing their own because obviously, you know, they've proven that they can do really premium hardware with the Nexus Q, even if it didn't, you know, really launch properly. But, uh, you know, Google obviously has a huge competitive advantage in that space being, you know, the people with the App Store or the marketplace of the Play Store. You just said that they proved they can do really... I mean, granted, the Nexus Q is a quality piece of hardware. Yeah, but it was a flop. They had to pull it off before they even sold it. I, I think it's a huge mistake for Google to get into making the hardware. I think if what they do with the game console is bless one like they do with the Nexus, but still allow everybody else to compete, that that makes sense to me. I'm still not certain I'm sold on this well, idea of Android consoles yet, but it's, I, it's I think Google should steer far away from actually creating the hardware themselves. Well, the thing about the Nexus Q was it was really expensive because it was such premium hardware. And the thing, you know, with the Android gaming market, you know, scene as it is currently, Bluestacks has already basically raced completely to the bottom with the free console. So it's kind of hard to compete with free unless, of course, you have something just, you know, banging hardware. Yeah, but couldn't Google just send out a, an update to any Google television to make it a console? Because it seems like it's running Android, so you can just tweak that. What's stopping Google from just saying, hey, you can buy a well, Bluetooth the, controller you and could, you've got you a could, console? You could also say that Apple TV is already a game console, mm -hmm. like Sarah mentioned, because you can AirPlay. The difference is having the right controllers and having it meant to be used for that and having a, maybe a modified store that, that highlights games better. I mean, you yes, you already can do a lot of the Android gaming on the Google TV consoles out there, the boxes out there. But again, I'll point out, Google didn't actually build any of the Google TV boxes. They just made the operating system tweak. I, I think that's smarter for them. Make an Android tweak like Google TV that's good for game consoles and help raise all the boats. Maybe contract with somebody like an Asus to make a box, uh, or maybe there's a better option than that. But I, I really don't think Google should make the hardware themselves. Google, has If they did a, a Nexus style, I totally agree with you. But if that's they what I'm talking like, about, opened yeah. up a spec to say, hey, you know, this is the Android gaming uh, spec, just like Google TV is the Android media center spec. Uh, unfortunately, though, what you end up with a lot of times is the Logitech review. Yes, I know. Well, that's I want the Nexus, like you said. That's a, that's a very good point. Uh, let's talk about uh, Time Warner Cable launching uh, their television app on Xbox 360 sometime later this summer. If you're a Time Warner Cable market, you can get up to up to 300 live channels. Uh, that's that's probably because it depends on the package you subscribe to. Must pay for Xbox Live to get it, though. 
Uh, the app will work with the Connect. You'll be able to take care advantage of voice controls, and it'll launch with live TV only, although they said later this year they hope to add some on-demand options as well. Now, Time Warner is already available on Roku, the same kind of app. They're available on iOS and Android with apps. Uh, they're coming to the Samsung TV. And Xbox already has Comcast. Uh, if you're a Comcast customer, you can already get a Comcast app for Xbox. This is one of the paths to having the box that allows you to get your cable over the internet. I, as you're a cord cutter. Oh, wait, no, that's Sarah. <laughs> uh, but either way, no, I, as, do you, do you think this is the wave of the future? Or is this another thing where they're trying to shove something down our throats that we don't want? Well, this still requires you to have a cable subscription, right? And it still requires you to be an Xbox Live member. So you need to have our Xbox Gold membership on there. So it's not like it's a tremendous shift yet. Time Warner has been pretty forward-thinking when it comes to using, having a lot of apps on lots of different platforms. They've been the ones in public talking about being on Apple television. They don't seem to, they really don't want to do the hardware business. As far as I can tell with their CEO, they really hate dealing with set-top boxes. So whatever else, whatever other company is like, hey, yeah, we'll do it. We'll be Roku or Xbox. They don't care as long as you're getting their content because if you're paying Time Warner, that's all they want. They don't want to maintain those soft, the, the hardware. And if something breaks, you complain to Microsoft. You probably won't even think to talk, talk to Time Warner if your console's busted. I wonder what, gonna what does up to ahead, 300 sir. live channels mean anyway? Well, I, my guess on that is you Depending subscribe on, to different levels yeah. of packages Depending in Time Warner. Depending on your tier with Time Warner. Yeah, exactly. As I think you're onto something. If they can sort of offload the whole hardware delivery part of this and they lose zero money from people who are paying them for cable subscriptions anyway, as long as the, the relationship between Microsoft and Time Warner stays strong and at this point neither of those companies are going anywhere, I think it's probably a good idea. But you have yeah, to pay I, for Xbox Live. I, I, well, sure, but you have to pay for Xbox Live just to have the privilege of watching Netflix, which you already pay for, on your TV if you have an Xbox. So it's not like that hasn't been proven before that it works. Um, I mean, I'm guilty of, of it just for the convenience factor, and I'm sure many more are. Uh, I, I must say, at first, I wasn't you know, sold on the whole Xbox One media-centricness. Uh, and no pun intended, but I think this is a game changer, and it's huge that this isn't part of the next gen console, but it's current. It's part of the the current console that has over 77 million, you know, uh, units uh, around the world. So that's that's kind of like it, it makes sense. If I were a Time Warner, this is the kind of deal that I would be looking for just to stay relevant. I think it is telling that they are available on more than just Xbox. They're like, sure, we'll go to Xbox, uh, but we'll also be on Roku because that might take off. We also just want to be on iOS and Android because who knows where that'll end up. We're talking about Android showing up on all these different Google TV type devices. Uh, maybe that happens someday that you can get your Time Warner cable through through a Logitech review type device. Although remember, Logitech isn't making those anymore. Sony's making them now. So uh, coming to a Samsung TV is interesting as well. I, I think this is just, I think you nailed it though, Darren. I think this is Time Warner just spreading out their uh, their options, right? Yeah, I mean, it worked for Netflix. You remember, you know, years ago, it was crazy. It was like, wow, Netflix has an app on all of these different esoteric devices. How can they possibly, you know, have that many developers coding for all of these different platforms? But it's like, that's how you win. You just hedge your bets and get on all the platforms. In fact, if you remember, if you look back at podcasting in 2005 and 2006, it was like, that was the goal. It's just get yourself on all of those, you know, dozens of video platforms. And then at the end of the day, like YouTube won or whatever, but that's what you do. It's early in the game. Uh, while we're talking about Microsoft, just a real quick plug, don't forget that uh, Mary Jo Foley, Paul Therott, and I, as, are going to be uh, together for a live Microsoft Build Conference Week special version of Windows Weekly later today. And if you're watching this or listening to this later on, go check it out, twit.tv slash WW, the Windows Weekly. It's going to be fun. Uh, meanwhile, Facebook, they, they've done email, uh, they've done instant messaging. They, they've tried to imitate all the portions of the Internet except chat rooms until now, possibly. Right, Sarah? Yeah, that's right. Uh, Tech, Josh Constein, sort of the Facebook uh, expert over at TechCrunch, uh, has sources from within Facebook saying that Facebook is working on chat rooms. Yeah, like the ones we're very familiar with. Uh, Facebook has actually confirmed to TechCrunch, yes, they're testing something, a new product known as Host Chat. Uh, they say it's, you know, like traditional IRC. It could basically help keep people within Facebook 
for a lot longer periods of time. You know, you're kind of in a room and people are chatting and you sort of leave the window open and you're sort of there more and you you meet new people and you make new friends. Facebook told um, TechCrunch, we do test things from time to time with a small percentage of users. This could certainly change. This could be scrapped. They could decide that it's not a good idea after all. But I think, really, especially with all of Facebook's competitors, I mean, Facebook is trying to compete with SMS, which is, sure, probably eventually on the out, but still being used. We've got iMessage. Uh, there's Google Hangouts. Then there's wildly popular apps like WhatsApp or Line, which is based in Japan, or, or Snapchat, which is almost like a whole different kind of way to communicate. So Facebook says, all right, well, we'll make clones of all of those. What about something like host chat. So uh, there is a screenshot at the TechCrunch article uh, that, that shows you what host chat would look like. Basically, at the top of your news feed, you could add an update, as you would in Facebook normally. But uh, along with update status or add a photo, you would then have a host chat button where you could invite your friends. And supposedly, it would sort of work in the way that, hey, I'm broadcasting works, where Ayaz could see that I've got a chat room open and he could just hop in. I wouldn't have to invite him. Then, of course, there are a variety of privacy settings where I could say open to all or maybe just open to friends of friends or just, you know, open to a select group of friends that are in a particular Facebook group. So the possibilities are endless. I think a lot of people would read something like this and say, chat rooms are so yesteryear, but I think <laughs> many of us who certainly work at Twit and those uh, in our audience know that chat rooms can be really fun. Does this seem too like old AOL days to anybody or is this actually a oh, yeah. good way to retain people? Are it's we just talking text? Well, it uh, so far, uh, the way that it's been tested is text only, but that doesn't mean there couldn't be emojis added in the future. <laughs> Facebook has its own brands of stickers. So you kind of have to assume this is maybe step one of something that would be more multimedia. I just see Facebook constantly doing this, and I don't see it succeeding a lot. I mean, granted, there are people who use Facebook Messenger. Tony Wang messaged me yesterday and gave me a sticker. It was very nice. made me feel all warm and fuzzy. But generally, I, I don't see Facebook adding these sorts of things and having them succeed. So I don't think it's a bad idea. Yeah, hosting a chat sounds interesting, right? If, I, if I'm a user of Facebook, which I'm not, but if I'm a heavy user, then all my friends jumping in and having a chat, I, that could be cool. But it doesn't, it doesn't seem like Facebook has a very good track record with any of this kind of stuff catching on. Yeah. It seems like another checkbox kind of thing. I assume video and audio is going to be added to this. It just seems like it's going to compete with Hangouts. Because if you just have a chat room and you just have text, that seems like that'd be really limited, uh, especially with what Google has right now. So why would they bother to do that? And I was reading the article, it's the tests were limited to the web only. So you couldn't do this on your mobile device. I'm sure all of that's coming when they actually put this together. But it's... I think it's kind of strange they didn't have it already, I guess. I thought I was looking, you can do multiple, you can uh, chat with multiple people, but you have to invite each and every one of them. Mm -hmm. To have an open chat like that seems seems like a good idea for something like Facebook. It is supposed to be social, after all. So why not actually talk to your friends just like, hanging out? But it, it just seems, I just don't know how much usage is going to get or what's what kind of uh, can of worms is going to open up for Facebook. Do they have to like police this if something goes wrong? And remember, like AOL always had to pay attention to what was going on in those chat rooms. I think Facebook is so big that they're at the point where you know you also have uh you're you have the ability kind of like with skype to uh leave a facebook video message for a friend who uses that i mean i don't know i've never gotten one of those from anybody that but, will change but that right is now. a feature okay thank you i'd like to get my first one and be oh really I, I just got a facebook messenger message from roger chang right like this second oh good so yeah. yeah, as soon as you say nothing happens, it happens. Right, but there are, there are certain features where I think Facebook says, eh, build it in there. I mean, we have the infrastructure to handle it. It's not necessary that it's like the most wonderful feature ever that everyone uses because if you're a smaller company, sometimes you have to say, well, we need to scale back, you know, and put our uh, engineers working on other things. With Facebook, why not? If they can host chat rooms and it gets certain people who only checked in for like five minutes here and there to stay for a couple hours... Well, then maybe they'll click on more ads. So they're not buying billions of dollars worth of companies anymore. They're just like, ah, what are we gonna, what, what are we gonna add? Chat rooms? Yeah. Well, they're doing both. Systems. They're doing. You both. know, I, I would say that I'm with Ayaz on this. As far as like this kind of being like their 
potential competitor to Hangouts because if Google Plus has done anything successful, it has been that. In fact, it's, a, it's even taken over what was Google Talk. And um, and yeah, I mean, they already have Skype. I could totally see them integrating something like this. So it is kind of weird to see something text only uh, come out, you know, I feel like that's just kind of the next obvious thing is to integrate the the uh, VoIP stuff that they already have and kind of foster communities through that as Google has done. But I guess really until then forward. we can enjoy what egg drop bots and where's channels. I'm looking forward to the Facebook news groups that will be. Right <laughs> uh, let's let's talk about uh, T-Mobile's bold moves event, July 10th, Wednesday, July 10th, 2:30 p.m. New York City. They're going to follow it with a happy hour and a celebrity chef, Ludo Lefiev. Uh, music by Harley Vieira Newton. This is going to be a big deal if you're invited. If you're part of the press that's invited. So what do we think? Uh, they say that this is their boldest moves, plural, yet. We're going to see a couple phones, maybe the Sony Xperia Z, Nokia Lumia 925, or maybe a BlackBerry Bold. Is that, Can we get, like, really parsing closely the language? Is that what they're talking about? It, they, there have been rumors that there's a phase two to their uncarrier plans, where they might have an option for no credit check where you just basically like buy the phone directly from them and get the service without needing a credit check, just becoming like a SIM card operator? Or are they going to announce they're going to go straight to LTE Advanced, the faster version of LTE? Darren, if you had to place your bets, is it one of these things or something totally different? It's one of those things. If I had Which one? That. You don't get um, off it. Well, I mean, the bold thing makes it kind of obvious with the uh, BlackBerry bold, but I, I would actually hope it's the latter and it's an LTE advanced. But that's, I think, wishful thinking. Sarah? Well, uh, <laughs> come on. I want to be like, what do they mean by bold moves? Let's pick it apart with a microscope. But I'm sort of like, I, I think the whole thing sounds weird. Uh, we got a celebrity chef. We got some music. Okay. Uh, how would that, I mean, are they apps that are preloaded on some sort of a phone? Appetizers, you mean? Appetizers, yeah. Ooh. Thank you. I want oh, apps. <laughs> <laughs> Mini corn dogs. <laughs> I just, I, I find the whole thing a little bit like, we're going to do something bold. And I'm looking at it like, yeah, I bet you are. Well, like the, I, the invite gives you nothing. It's yeah. a big, you know, T-Mobile, pink or magenta, whatever color this is, and with the text, our boldest moves yet, and then the actual details as to the chef and everything. I, I would think that if T-Mobile is really going to do anything to keep themselves relevant, they already did that giant thing where they, they change the way they do contracts. They don't do contracts anymore. You have a subsidized, you, you're paying for your phone totally differently now. So that was pretty bold already. If they're going to do something crazy and they're really going to try to stand by a boldest, it has to be a faster network. It has to be LTE uh, advanced because that was one of the things T-Mobile was hanging its hat on with HSPA Plus saying, we have the fastest network. So while they may not be uh, as, uh, as, as, as large as, as Verizon, where Verizon's covered the entire country in 4G, if T-Mobile saying, look, we, we're not everywhere, but where we are, we're super fast. So you don't think an uncarrier announcement would would uh, another, like a phase two of the uncarrier saying now you don't even need a credit check you can just bring your own phone and we'll give you the sim no questions asked you don't think that would be big enough oh no I, I think that could be like a little throwaway line on a slide I don't think that'd be a big deal at all for for T-Mobile especially after what they've done with their uncarrier status by having a phase two that just is an evolution and that's not a boldest move I guess because I've seen a lot of people very excited about that prospect saying oh it'd be like Europe you just buy your sim card and then you can put it in whatever phone you want you can't do that right now unless they can actually take any phone from any 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 device like if they can well, maybe they'll just yeah, unlock all phones phone. that's I get the that thing CDMA, GSM, they always right? have they, there's always the frequency issues with LTE. So if even had a Verizon phone try to bring the AT&T, unless it's a specific kind of phone, you can't do that. So I'd imagine, I'm still thinking the advanced network. I, I think it's going to be phase two of the uncarrier. They're going to make a big deal out of it. And I think probably a phone. I, I think you're right that LTE advanced would be the biggest announcement they could make. But I, I find that unlikely. Yeah, you know, maybe, not I don't know. They just bought that Spectrum, maybe. Didn't they just get uh, the, all that breakup money from AT and T? So they have a ton of money. Oh, they—that's they, long. They spent that a lot. That was that was spent on like actually being able to get off of HSPA Plus at all. So I don't I don't know if that gives them any advantage towards LTE Advanced over LTE. Maybe. Guess we'll have to wait for July 10th. No, I'm gonna be gone. Let's talk oh, well. about it until then. Let's every, yes. every day. day. I like every it. Every day. Uh -huh. Why not? Bring uh, back the rumor mill also, while we're at it. Uh, if you give me enough bitcoins, I'll do it.
Oh, you know, you better be careful what you do with those Bitcoins, though, Tom, because the Federal Drug Enforcement Agency in the U.S., the DEA, has announced for the first time that it seized 11.02 Bitcoins, which translates into, at least at the time, about $814.22 from a man named Eric Daniel Hughes from South Carolina, who was trying to buy illegal substances with bitcoins so this never happened before at least not something that the dea has 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 talked about publicly now i think one of the questions is well all right how does this work uh for those of us who try to understand bitcoin but still feel like we have a somewhat flimsy understanding of it if a government isn't printing bitcoins and they're not regulating bitcoins how do they seize bitcoins uh there's a uh there's a blog called let's talk bitcoin it's sort of like talks about uh, Bitcoin news and kind of how it works, says well, a couple of things might have happened. DEA agent could have used a computer with an unencrypted wallet, transferred the amount to a DEA controlled wallet, or the DEA might have set, uh, set up something like a honeypot trap at uh, Silk Road, uh, which is an anonymous marketplace. And uh, Bitcoin is usually uh, known to be used to purchase some illegal items uh, through their back channel. And Hughes could have transferred the Bitcoins to the DEA, not aware of the honeypot. Darren, what do you think? Uh, is this the sort of thing that seems obvious to you, what the DEA might have done? Well, I mean, I, I, I'm not like big on vice or any of that stuff, but uh, I mean, it makes sense uh, if you're the DEA and there's drugs being sold in Silk Road to, you know, uh, go after that. What I find interesting here is that um, they went after a buyer and not necessarily a seller. And I think that's telling of, you know, maybe some of the, the feasibilities of, you know, the technology. Uh, I think it's most likely that, uh, that the person that was buying, you know, supposedly drugs uh, was buying it from uh, the DEA and it was a honeypot sort of deal. But I don't know how you would uh, go after a seller in the case of Bitcoin. And um, and I think this actually is probably going to be the first one, uh, first big story to kind of wake people up and make them realize like Bitcoin isn't any more anonymous than, well, than cash. No, exactly. It's a That's a, it's more a really difficult good point. to be anonymous. Because the DEA seized it as property. I don't think they ha it has to be issued. I mean, they could seize your computer. Your government didn't make your computer. So they could just seize Bitcoin saying, yeah, this was involved in, in, in the sale. We're going to take it uh, just, just like anything else. But how they got it is interesting. And the honeypot seems like the most likely way. Yeah, I think it's, uh, I mean, there are a lot of things, if you think of tangible items, which of course Bitcoin is not, that the D, or the, the, the government, a variety of governments, might not be regulating, certainly might not be making, but they can take it from you if it's involved in something that's illegal and you're not going to get it back. In this case, I mean, these Bitcoins ended up being less than $1,000, so I don't know, I mean, 800 and change is, is not nothing, but it's not like it's a huge amount of money, but... But this is, pro yeah, it's probably the beginning of what's more, what's to come. And it'll be interesting to see if this changes the way that uh, people might be thinking Bitcoin is a great way to transfer money if you're doing stuff that's under the table. You know, to be honest, this reminds me right now of the very first time somebody was busted by the RIAA for downloading MP3s. Yeah. Anybody else feeling that? Uh, no, I'm not because... I don't feel like this is nearly the same level of intentional criminality or or having the effects that the, this is this person knew absolutely what they were doing is illegal and is illegal in every sense of the word. Uh, whereas downloading the first MP3s, people a lot of people didn't realize it was illegal uh, at all, and it certainly uh, wasn't the the implications of downloading an mp3 shouldn't be considered on the same par as drug use uh i guess we could argue that's a whole separate argument but i'm not i'm not getting that feeling off of this that way do you mean just like this is the precedent setting thing this kicks off that, that's what i'm saying i'm saying it's a precedent of, yeah. setting thing for something where it was an intangible you know i have you know you the similarities between napster and kazaa and, and mp3s being you know just digital and the same thing with bitcoin you know, I, I guess the difference here is rather than, you know, downloading a, a file, which is just ones and zeros, you're actually getting, you know, a bag of crack or whatever the kids are doing these days.
<laughs> right. I mean, it, it, it is different because with the MP3 was the end in, in and of itself. The Bitcoin could be, could be used for anything. The bit, Bitcoin itself isn't uh, illegal. But then MP3 was not illegal either. It was all depends on which MP3 you were downloading. So I guess that right. works it's too. Right. Like, it's like BitTorrent, you know, and it gets that stigma because yeah. people are like, oh, BitTorrent, that's what you use to pirate movies. It's like, yeah, well, you know, you can buy cookies with Bitcoin. You can. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I've, I've noticed that. I haven't done it yet, though. I should. I don't want to spend any of my Bitcoins, though. I don't have that. Many. Well, that doesn't, it doesn't, then you're not going to, all right. Well, fine. Let's uh, finish off with a very interesting app coming to the iPad called TouchCast. Explain yourself, Ayaz. Sure, because I, I have nothing to do with it other than finding the story on all things D. TouchCast, okay, this is an application right now for iPad only. And what it does, it lets you create and watch videos layered with live web pages, YouTube clips, and Twitter streams. And uh, you, when, you, when you're on the actual application, you can run a video and you can... You'll see these little uh, markers where you can see where the live web pages will be, and once you click the page, the video will shrink to the to the bottom right, and you'll be able to interact with the web page if you wanted to. If somebody had put a live Twitter stream, it'll be live as you're watching it. So things will change as the video is going on. Uh, there's also video creation tools built in. You can't edit the video, unfortunately. It's it's just go for it. They have a teleprompter style thing you can use if you want to use that. And like I was saying, right now it's only on the iPad, but TouchCast's plan is to launch an embeddable video player for the web. So in theory, you'll be able to have a video, and they're like right now something would pop up here, and you'd be able to click that and maybe even uh, manipulate what's going on with that little widget. To me, it seems like they're kind of smashing the second screen that you'd use in your hand right onto the first one. Uh, D Darren, do you want to interact with your videos like this? Well, I think it's interesting that basically what they've developed here is a tiling interface for video, which is interesting because we've already had that in any modern operating system that has a GUI. So I don't necessarily see the need to have an additional plugin. I mean, it very much reminds me of back when you had to have like all of these esoteric special plugins uh, aside from just real player back in the day to watch video. So they have definitely an uphill battle of both, you know, um, getting the, uh, the installation base as well as kind of convincing people that this is something that they need. Cause I look at this and I'm like, okay, as a professional content creator, I can do this much better without having to touch a screen uh, if I want to create that kind of experience. Uh, or if I did want it to be interactive, I'm just trying to think of the use case here where I would want people both watching my video and interacting with some pages on the screen. Well, Maybe a game tech show? News today. Tech News Today would be a perfect example of this where we could, if, if this were working well enough, just bring up the stories and as we talk about them we could bring up another story we could point to it our part of the story we could highlight stuff like that uh we could use it for charts instead of having to have jason pull them up separately and then have a screencast and all of that sort of thing i i think that theoretically could work could be really cool or you could go to pull the chat room in and, and show what the chat room is talking about pull in what twitter is talking about uh I, I do think it's a little wonky with an ipad i tried it out this morning and i put the dock with the news fuse on the left which was pretty cool to just have that over there and easy. Now, I know, Darren, you're right. There's lots of ways to do this, but this was a dead simple way to do it. Uh, and don't forget, that's important for a lot of people just starting out. And like, all I have is the iPad. I have nothing else. And all of a sudden, they can do stuff like this. But the weird thing was, like, I had to hold the iPad while I'm talking. It just isn't comfortable to do for a lot of situations, I don't think. I think it shows what how how we're moving in the direction of customization of your screen. Yes, video is a big part of uh, what many people want to use their tablets for. This is an iPad app. I understand that uh, eventually um, there'd be an embeddable video player as well. But like you said, Tom, it wasn't a perfect solution, but you could kind of see where if it was a little bit stronger, you'd really like it. And it, it is offering something that, like you said, Darren, is not anything new, but it's in a different way. And I don't know. Yeah, I think I think for something like TNT, that's a perfect example. You know, maybe you've got a chat room uh, a window open as well. You're looking at web pages. you got a lot of sources and things are moving really fast. That's a great use case for something like this. Yeah, we used to do something like this when I was working with Randall Bennett at TechV. We would have a persistent video player that would shrink to the right side. This was kind of, I, I've seen this thing before because I worked on it. And the, the B-roll would be in the background so you could interact with the web page. And we had a playlist that would time out with that. So it would actually change as it was going along with the video. I think that 
for the web, this could be really interesting because right now we've got we, we've seen radio go to TV and then TV go to the web. It's just what is web television or what's going to be web video for real? Because it, should you have interactive elements there in that video? Because right now it's just kind of replicating what we've had already. If you can manipulate and use the tools you have at the web at your disposal and have all this live streaming stuff going on, even when you've recorded your, your, uh, your video, I think that could be where web video goes in the future. And TouchCast, they really did put a lot of powerful tools in there for video creation, even lower thirds and easy widgets to use, even though it is a little clunky right now. I think this could be something big in the long run. I don't know if this company is going to be the one to do it, but I think this is going to get ripped off a lot. I mean, All in right, some well, sense, YouTube already has this in that there are annotations, mm -hmm. so you can have both the lean back experience with that, or you can just be hunched over clicking all those annotations and following the next link to the next kitten. But that, that, that's a good. It's not screenshots, but but still a sort of interactivity. Let's move from the less important uh, process of creating interactive informational videos to the much more important process of creating meme pictures in the randomizer. randomizer. Certainly this isn't the first company to do this, but Imager launching a meme generator, and of course because they're the popular Reddit photo storage selection, you can now make yourself the overly attached girlfriend. You don't have to use I can has cheeseburger. And Imager just had a new Android app as well. So uh, you can now create memes all day long, Darren. Yeah, I, I know what you mean, Tom. I, hey. I'm just going to get lost in this. <laughs> Dude, <laughs> I was not on the meme bandwagon until recently, and now it just it makes sense. I think I was a little late to the party, but... Like I get that the the whole cultural icon of it, just being able to spread like a like a previously understood idea or behavior. I'm just thinking. Sarah, about how, oh, I'm sorry. I as important innovation or most important innovation. It's definitely the most important innovation. And Imager better make sure their servers are up to task because when Reddit notices the Imager's down, Reddit gets really mad. So, That's right. You'll improve uptime. So yeah, this is going to make <laughs> this is either going to make or break Imager because if you if you're going to use their tools and they're hosting the pictures and they go down, yeah, Reddit's going to be really ticked. I think anything that helps create more fodder for BuzzFeed top 23 lists is okay with me. Absolutely agreed. Let's see what's in the future. Can you read the future, Sarah? Well, can we talk about the present just for a second because as Darren and Len mentioned at the top of the show, it is Tom Merritt's birthday today. Happy birthday, Tom Merritt. Happy birthday. Thank hey. you very much. Are you going to do something fun after the show? Are you no. going to eat some cake? Are they going to write tech no. history today pie? on the cake? Barbecue? I'm going to go buy some pie. And then uh, later awesome. on this evening, I'm going to have old fashions on the porch because oh, I'm that, an old man. Oh, that sounds nice. And the dogs will lay out. Well, Tom, you actually share a, 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 a special day. It's not just Tom Day. It's Felicia rifle. Day's birthday. Oh. But it's Felicia Day's birthday, and it's also Tau Day. Happy Tau Day, everyone. That's T-A-U. If you want to know more about Tau, you can go to tauday.com. 6.28. Google Plus turns two years old today. Oh, the birthday you is share a birthday rolling. with Google Plus? I know. That's, I know, that's the big news. That's pretty <laughs> special. And Yahoo's going to implement new protection rules for users under the age of 12 by June 30th. So starting next week... Screw you, kids. <laughs> Get off my lawn. <laughs> Let's see what's incoming. Incoming message. We got James back. Accuzod checking in uh, from Microsoft Build Day 2. He's got some good stuff for us. Take it away, James. Greetings. This is Accuzod checking in from Day 2 of the Microsoft Build Conference here in San Francisco. Now, today I saw something amazing. Now, it wasn't this 82-inch touchscreen monitor, nor even this 3D-printed guitar or dragon's head that caught my eye. It was this giant remote-controlled bowling ball. This invention allows a bowling ball to be completely controlled by a human operator standing a safe distance away. Now, why was a giant remote-controlled bowling ball at a developer's conference, you ask? Well, geeks are traditionally bad at sports, so this device allows us to participate in a common bonding ritual without having to leave our computers or deal with those funky rental shoes. This advancement paves the way for research into remote-controlled baseballs, footballs, and girlfriends. <laughs> From the Microsoft Build Conference, this is Accuzod. That's awesome. Uh, thank you, uh, Accuzod, for your reports from Build. Those were fantastic. Good production value there, uh, don't you think? Very. 
I'm like impressed. Best. When I first saw the video, I thought that was a Nexus Q. I really did. And I was like, what? It's a huge oh. Nexus Q, a huge remote oh. control Nexus Q. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, we uh, that is, must have inspired Peter. Our our Accuzod reports uh, for uh, he, he sent us a video voicemail as well with his perspective on dev kits for Xbox. Tom, this is Peter, aka Fathom from Twitter. On episode seven eighty three, you were talking about having to pay for a dev kit for the Xbox Connect for the PC. If you're a game developer for the gaming consoles, this is normal. You, you have to pay around ten to $20,000 alone just for a dev kit. So paying around $400 for the new Kinect or $1,500 for Google Glass doesn't seem that high of a price at all. Thanks again for making an awesome show. I don't know, devs, do you agree? Do you, do you agree that that's a, a perfectly acceptable price? I mean, it's $99 for the year to be a dev for iOS, but a whole different animal, granted than doing Google Glass or Connect. Hmm. We got any emails, Ayas? I don't know, maybe. Oh, hey, look, there's one. Richard Gunther from Washington, D.C. wrote in and said, on yesterday's show, you were talking about the ability to comment on a social stream about an event that's already happened. Your examples were the Tony Awards and things on television. Isn't this get glue? I try to avoid Twitter during big events because I don't care about something I haven't watched yet but still plan to. But Gecklu is focused on event viewing or listening, and I'm always amazed how many people are watching exactly what I'm watching and still talking about it days or sometimes even months later. Of course, there are occasionally spoilers in the Gecklu stream, but you deal with that on Twitter too. Kind of forgot about Gecklu in that one. Yeah, he's totally, Richard's right, as usual. He usually is, actually. Uh, the only difference is that the people you want to follow aren't necessarily on Gecklu. They may be. But the people you follow on Twitter are likely the people you really want to hear from. So it's all about where the audience is. That's the only thing I would say. All right. Well, thank you uh, for joining us. Darren Kitchen, always good to have you along. Uh, what's next on Hack Across America? Where are you headed? Oh, I'm heading to uh, San Diego on Saturday for a huge meetup at uh, Balboa Park. Uh, details over at hackacrossamerica.com. And uh, Tom, I wanted to ask you, you're a fan of 3D printers, right? I am, yeah. I go 3D well, you, printers. Well, you should go over to hak5.org and check out. We did a great piece with the maker of the printer bot. It's pretty cool. hak5.org. Going now. Actually, I, I should finish the show first, but then I'll take a look. <laughs> the right. maker of the print bot and Bit Biddleby? Yeah, Biddleby is an awesome that? IRC oh, cool. uh, kind of mashup between IRC and like Facebook and all sorts of cool stuff. Check it out, hak5.org. And of course, we must check in with Mr. Len Peralta now to find out the illustrations that he has uh, he's been making throughout the show. The chat room has been enjoying them today, Len, I have to say. I've, been, I've seen oh. lots of LOLs. <laughs> well, good, good. I uh, will go from the top uh, of the stories here, the, the, the bottom six stories, actually. Um, this is the uh, Google uh, doing kind of the Xbox thing. Uh, it will probably end up watching you, too, just like the Xbox one will. And uh, so that's my take on that. Um, once again, uh, one, with uh, who's watching the watchers? Time Warner Cable on um, uh, yeah. Microsoft, the Xbox. Have you noticed that there's all these eyes looking at you? Time That's Warner true. Cable's logo is an eye. The Connect is an eye. So who's who's watching who here? It's like Soviet question. Russia. In <laughs> Soviet it's Russia, like Soviet Russia, watches you. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, the Google, uh, I'm sorry, Facebook chat room. Uh, this is a take on uh, Mark Zuckerberg. User Mark not, Zuck, not Mark Zuckerberg wants to know, what are you wearing? Never mind, I already know. That's, uh, <laughs> yeah. Because I know everything about it. It's a very ASL. paranoid uh, theme today. <laughs> exactly. Uh, bold. The bold Whoa. moves thing. I thought this, <laughs> <laughs> this is what I think is going to happen at the Bold Moves, the T-Mobile Bold Moves conference here. It's going to be pretty exciting, actually, folks. So you may want to keep an, uh, check, and check that out. That's my I thought the full one. moon was last week. Yeah. <laughs> I get what the T is. What's the A? Go Never mind. <laughs> oh, I didn't even catch that. Uh, uh, Bitcoin. Poor Mario uh, and his uh, got busted oh. with his Bitcoins. <laughs> he was buying mushrooms. Why Mario? Because he buys mushrooms all the time. <laughs> I thought that was well, Luigi. I don't know. That's the coins. first thing I. That's the first thing I thought yeah. of. You know, Mario jumping and getting all those coins. So yeah, <laughs> unfortunately, he got busted. And uh, finally, uh, uh, touching uh, uh, web, web video. <laughs> Uh, it's yeah. a I, you know, of course, the eyes uh, touching, uh, fingers coming out of the <laughs> eyes. There, a little bit strange. Of course, he wants to see more, more, more Dayman dubstep. 
That is the creepiest thing I've ever seen you draw. Like Pan's Labyrinth. Is that creepier than the uh, than the jeans I drew a couple weeks ago? Yeah, the jeans about, are about on par with That's that. True. Yeah, yeah. The jeans nice. might be a little bit creepier. Yeah. <laughs> Close second. Uh, that's awesome. Uh, well done, Len Peralta, as usual. If people want to uh, find these prints, find out what you're up to, where do they go? Yeah, they can follow me at Len Peralta on uh, Twitter.com. <laughs> and I'll uh, post at least one of these. Uh, maybe I'll take it to the chat room and find out which one they like, and I'll put that up there a little bit later today. So, Excellent. Uh, thank you again, Len. Thank you again, Darren. Thank you again, Accuzod, for the build reports. Uh, thank you all for submitting stories at our subreddit, technewstoday.reddit.com. We look at that every day to figure out our lineup. Also, don't forget about twit.tv slash best of if you want to note notable moments uh, throughout the week on any of our Twitch shows for us to put in our end of year shows. You can find us on the web at twit.tv slash TNT. Email us TNT at twit.tv. Or give us a call. Leave us a voicemail. 260-TNT-SHOW. We'll be back on Monday with Willie Dills Gregory from The Instance as our guest. He's also from TortureCast. We'll see you then. Happy birthday, Felicia Day! Yeah.